This is the Great North Wrestling Podcast, the official podcast of the Hannibal TV, Canada's number one pro wrestling YouTube channel, with your host, three-time Canadian champion and GNW lead reporter, Devin Hannibal Nicholson. This is Hannibal from the TheHannibalTV.com, and we have a special guest this week on the Great North Wrestling Podcast. She is a former WCW manager as Lady Blossom. She's a former world-class championship wrestling manager. Uh, she's the ex-wife of Billy Jack Haynes, who a lot of you probably remember from WWE, and more recently his... Uh, erratic interviews that have been posted on the internet and she's also the ex-wife of six-time world champion and wwe hall of famer stone cold steve austin and she's coming to us from london uk janie clark how are you today hi i'm doing great and thank you so much for having me on i've been watching your show and uh has a lot of uh really you know people really love your show so i'm grateful that you invited me on today well, thank you. We're growing uh, all the time. And actually, your ex-husband, uh, Steve Austin, actually called me in uh, January, which was a shock that he watched the show, too. So I was uh, highly complimented by that. And I have read his book in the past, and he did talk about you in the book, so I was aware of you. And then we have a common friend and I noticed that he posted about you and now I'm halfway through your book. You just sent it to me last week. So, uh, it's called yeah. through the shattered glass. And maybe before we get into the interview, maybe you could, uh, tell the fans out there where they could pick up this book. Uh, the book is available on amazon.com or amazon.co.uk. Um, I'm just a self-publisher, so that's the only place you can actually buy it. But if uh, fans do want a signed copy, I do send them out myself. So, you know, if they were to send me something on Facebook or something like that, I would sign a copy for them, which which I do do fairly often. And your name is uh, Jeannie Clark on Facebook, if anyone wants to look you up there. Do you have Twitter, too? Or? I do have Twitter at Clark Genie. Okay, very good. So fans can uh, find her there. Now, you were a big... Uh, I've actually read half your book, and for fans, I'll start right away. This this will be a two-part interview. Um, she's had a very extensive career, and I do hope to interview her in person one day if our paths ever cross, because I'm sure people would love to see uh, her on video. Uh, she's always been known for her looks. That's one of the reasons why uh, she was so successful in wrestling in the short time she was involved. But uh, can you tell us a little bit, uh, without going into too much detail, of your childhood and going to rock concerts and eventually going to wrestling matches where you ended up meeting Chris Adams? Um, basically, um, yeah, I, I didn't have the greatest of childhoods. Um and uh, I did um, have to stay in a uh, in a what the, a home of sorts. We we thought it was a school, me and my sister, but uh, we were actually taken away from my mum because she did have a problem with alcoholism. So that was quite difficult. Um, maybe somewhere along the line, um, I when I was a teenager, I I started to like going to concerts and um one of my friends uh her father was a wrestling fan i had never actually seen wrestling before except when i was over at her house sometimes i would sort of hear him shouting at the tv because that was what the world of sport on back in the day uh where they had big daddy and giant haystacks and mark rocco kendo nagasaki i don't even know if you remember that but it was massive oh, in the uk it, yeah um dynamite yeah, kid and davy boy smith UK. were also on it I dynamite believe. davy yeah and I, I knew them when they were teenagers just starting out as i was um but uh, one one day my friend's dad who had tickets to the show he he couldn't go because he was ill, and, and I happened to go to a show with my friend here in the UK and where I live, in the small town where I live. And um, 
at the match matches that night, uh, Chris was there and he approached me and um, it was one of those things where he'd say, hey, you know, can I have your number? I never thought he would call me because I thought, you know, these guys probably just ask for loads of girls' numbers. But uh, we didn't have, like, mobile phones back then. And uh, my mom said to me, please, can you call this guy Chris back because he's just bugging me with calling me all the time. And um, I called him back and he invited me to, to go to the Birmingham Motor Show up north and um, I, I thought that sounded really fun. So I, I got on the train up there and went on a date with Chris. I only just met him once. And um, we, we started to date and eventually we moved in together. We um, would, would, well, he would have a fan club and I would run his fan club for him. And uh, he knew... Uh, uh, a guy called Yasu Fuji, because Chris, Chris was actually a judo guy. He was on the British judo team. And um, Yasu Fuji was also a, a martial arts fighter, and he happened to know the Labels, who were also judo guys. So through that judo connection, Chris got an invite to start out in Los Angeles. And we got on a plane, and we were off to L.A., so it was shortly after but prior to going to Los Angeles um, Chris had a little idea that he would like to have me go to the ring with him and be his second as like a boxing second you know where you just go in and you would give the them water and, and wipe them down with a towel so because it was rounds there ethnicity. for people that don't know right it was rounds just in case anyone has it was round yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in between the rounds, I would come in the ring, and uh, it got quite a lot of publicity. It was kind of cute little thing going on there, and that was my first time I'd ever sort of started traveling. In uh, it was for joint promotions, traveling around the halls of the UK, and that's where I met Davy Boy and Dynamite, and some of the big names back then were, you know, Mark Rollable Rocco and. Um, it what was, was Dynamite it was like in those was, days? What would Dynamite Kid have I, been like? I didn't get to talk to him that much, but everybody really thought he was a fantastic worker. Um, and, you know, he seemed really nice. I, I don't remember him, because you know, I've heard some stories that he was, you know, could be quite aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't remember uh, anybody saying that back then. And I only knew him then. I didn't never meet him again after uh, he went on to, I think, Canada. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, he came to Calgary. But I, I, yeah, yeah. But uh, he was very young, and Chris thought he was fantastic. You know, his work was fantastic. Now, Chris had a bit of a, of a reputation, didn't he, as a, as a bit of a tough guy. You were mentioning judo, but he would also be involved in some of these uh, bar fights after the matches, is that right? Yeah, um, you know, I was really young then, and obviously I was sort of in love with him then, and he progressively got a lot worse, as we know, um, later on. I saw uh, a few problems very, very early on, even in the UK, with when he had a drink, he, he, he did get uh, in a lot of fights and occasionally, uh, you know, he'd come home and he had like blood splattered on his shirt and say, oh my God, I've been in a fight and we hit these guys with baseball bats and, and oh my God, the police might be after us and stuff like that. Also, another thing I remember was we were eating... Um, Chinese food one night and somebody sort of innocently really if I think back as as they passed his table like knocked his elbow you know knocked, knocked him and he kind of had this frown on his face and he was like you know that that's out of order because he didn't say sorry and I'm like oh just leave it it's no big deal because just sort of shoved him a little bit in the shoulder as he walked by and Chris just got up off the table and followed him out and and he said, hey, what do you think you're doing? Or words to that effect. And 
the next thing he had butted him and his blood was like pouring from his nose and I just thought, wow, you know. Luckily, those were the days before cell phones where uh, no one caught that on tape and he couldn't have been arrested. (laughs) Yeah, but I think he he had some rage problems and um, obviously he died because of those problems you know um yeah we won't get into the, uh, that part in this yeah. part of the interview yeah. we'll uh, okay we'll save yeah. that for the but second yeah, I, saw but that, I saw that very early on that that he definitely and and i was i was obviously really young and i was quite afraid of him when he got like that but i was also very aware not to say anything to him because i was too scared of him possibly being only 19 i didn't like to um antagonize him to get into those uh, big rages that he could get into and drinking in the uk i re- recall from my experience there it's a little different than north america like it's quite common for people to drink after the matches there and like even after work for people with regular jobs to go to the pub is, is that correct like more common than yeah. in the states it's part of the culture more it's, it's kind of like it is the culture and i think it has a lot to do with the weather because you know everybody gets dark and it gets cold and everyone goes to the pub and um i think it's just sort of something you grow up knowing that everybody goes to the pub true yeah um but I think the beer is a lot stronger here. <laughs> yeah, and it's also yeah, a lot more expensive. We have a really strong beer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, when you were wrestling for joint promotions, was Brian Dixon involved in that at that time? No, but um, I do remember he, Chris once said to me that he he would like us to go to Brian Dixon, but I think what happened was uh, the the USA thing came up. And, and Chris was a good wrestler, but, you know, he was always going to be sort of, I'm going to say, putting over Big Daddy and people like that. So he was never going to really, um, you know, be like a, a star. Um, but he, I don't really recall uh, him ever really wanting to stay in the UK. He really had his sights on going to the US. So what were your first impressions of Los Angeles when you uh, arrived there from the UK? Wow. I mean, it was just amazing. We we didn't really have a lot, but we were very happy at that time. We, we got to a, a hotel called the Flamingo West um, on Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica. It was kind of run down, um, but we had some money saved up. But we quickly ran out because when we got to the him to work at the NWA for the Labels, they actually were only giving him like one or two shows a week, and I think they were like forty dollar payoffs. So it was it was um, there was a time that we actually slept on the beach and uh, we only had monkey nuts to eat, but. Funnily enough, we were so happy because we were just ecstatic that we were there. Uh, but it did end up that I had to go to work to uh, help pay for for our hotel that we were at. And um, I, just down the road was a Santa Monica Pier, and I would go down there, and um, I got a job at a restaurant where I would stand outside and draw people in, like, as a hostess. And so I made some money, and I also did some modeling. And... That helped us to get a car, and, and, and eventually, of course, Chris got a few more shows. I, I don't recall them being a lot, but I think San Bernardino, uh, we went to um, Long Beach, and a few shows, but the money was quite poor back then. And then Chris went down to Mexico. Because that was the time when WWE was pretty much taken over and putting all the territories out of business, so the... The LaBelle's territory, I guess, was on its last legs at that point. Yeah, um, we didn't really get that much time there. And um, I know soon after, we went up to Portland, um, you know, but we were really happy in L.A. And we were just, you know, the weather, the beach, it was such a different world from 
from where we lived in the Midlands here in the UK. So, you know, to us, it was just amazing. Loved it in Los Angeles. Um, Chris wasn't so happy in Portland because he, he we, we were driving up there and we stopped and we stopped at a Wendy's and he said, I'm not going to like it here. And I didn't actually reply to him. And... Um, yeah, we we had some our problems there because we actually broke up and split up there. And that's it's, when it's, you were pregnant you know, too, right? Did you get did you get pregnant in L.A. or at the tail end of the L.A. or was it in Portland? Um, I got pregnant in L.A. and I actually came back to the U.K. to uh, give birth to Jade, Chris and I's daughter, because we didn't actually have the money to pay for uh, labor and delivery and all of that because we didn't have insurance. Obviously, here you don't... I think the same for Canada, actually. We we actually have socialized medicine. So uh, Chris went, stayed in Mexico, and I actually flew to the UK. So Jade was born here. When she was about three months old, we, uh, Chris and I went back to LA. And then up to... We, I think Jade was about one years old when we actually got to Portland. And that was for Don Owens, who was running the territory yeah. at the time. Um, who were some of the other wrestlers in that territory at that time? Obviously, Billy Jack Haynes, I think you met there. Is there anyone else that uh, fans would recognize that, that made a name for themselves? Playboy um, Buddy Rose, I think. Buddy Rose was there. Um, that was an interesting before. story from your book. Sorry to interrupt, but before I forget, I read that Buddy Rose... Everyone remembers he did have a low-level position in WWE, but apparently you said that he actually invited you to be his manager in WWE at that point, which I guess probably could have yeah. been huge for you if you had taken that. I think I think it was well known that, that Chris was a ladies' man. Now, this kind of started after the birth of Jade, and I'll, I'll go into that because what happened Portland was a bit of a party territory um, and and Chris started to um, not come home at night I think you would have read that yeah. um, there were a lot of other girls and obviously it really hurt me and made me feel not good enough and I think everybody knew that, that uh, he had kind of a lot of different girls and I think Buddy Rose actually called me when uh, he, he thought maybe we were splitting up, and he he did uh, did offer me to go with him, but obviously I didn't do that. <laughs> but but yeah, he did phone me up and and ask me if I'd like to go to be his manager in WWE. Because at that time they didn't really have female valets, so that would have been a very unique thing, and it was booming at that time. So. That's that's very interesting. And you said you, I guess you received some some calls from from girls at the house, and that's one of the things that uh, got your intuition. Yeah. Out. Well, actually, see, I I'd, I'd, I'd had to come back to the UK because uh, my grandmother died, and I came back for a funeral. And uh, I got back when I got back to Portland. Um, the phone would ring and be different girls and. Um, I think Chris kept saying sorry. He, d he he didn't deny it. He said sorry, and I don't, you know, I really sorry, and and he, I will keep forgiving him. But there came a point where I didn't think he was going to change. Um, in Portland, obviously, I had no family, and I hadn't got a car. I hadn't learned to drive at that point. In Los Angeles, I had a lot of different. Uh, public transportation I was working myself but I was quite isolated in in Oregon so uh, without any money of my own so I was alone and sometimes it would be three whole nights Chris just wouldn't come home or, or call and he'd been with other girls or partying with the boys and I just became extremely depressed with that basically what happened was um, I think Billy was over to see Tommy Rogers, who lived next door, and and he kind of shook his head and he goes, "Oh, I'm so sorry for you," you know. And I sat down with him and I chatted, and he said, he told me a story. I don't know if he should have done that, but but he said to me, you know, I asked Chris Adams, "Why do you 
do that to to Jeannie and and he's apparently well Billy said that Chris said well sometimes if if you have a piece of steak every night occasionally you like a piece of chicken and I was like oh my god that's just awful so basically you know Billy was telling me that as well and he Billy said I said to him you know I don't really have any money to go home and by now I had become resentful I suppose really resentful to Chris to where I wanted to leave him he of, wasn't of giving you did, much obviously. money either right because you were relying no. on him and he was partying and not giving you much money for the house I, ha I had I had no money and no friends and no family so I was Ex extremely depressed and lonely now Billy just happened to be like someone who talked to me about it and I didn't really have that many people to talk to and he said you know he kind of confirmed to me that Chris was cheating on me so much and and also he said oh you know is there anything I can do to help you out and I I, do, I don't do think that I had feelings for Billy because I didn't have anybody else and he was really nice to me and I would have perceived that as somebody I could talk to at that time. I was like 20, 22 years old, something like that. And, um, and uh, I, Billy said, look, I'll help you out. And, you know, I think he had a crush on me and, and I really liked the attention probably that I wasn't getting from Chris. I think Billy and I did have feelings, quite a lot of feelings. He did want to get married and we we did stay together for about a year, but ultimately Billy just had so many secrets and he just didn't communicate those secrets I don't know what was going on with him but I don't think we had enough sort of love to carry on but we mutually parted it wasn't you know anything bitter we got an uncontested divorce and what was Chris's reaction you know, uh, when you left him for Billy well you see Chris's reaction was always he'd cry and he'd go please don't leave me please don't leave me but i would seen it so many times before it would be about the tenth time but then it would happen again and happen again and he did that again but I was like but you you don't mean it because this you know the summit he did so many times that um in the end I just sort of lost hope I suppose that things could ever change and I certainly wasn't like um romantically attracted to him after you well, which you probably wouldn't be after you knew there were like other girls calling me and you, you just like it, it it stopped me wanting to sleep with him and and um i suppose uh for a short time even though <clears throat> excuse me we became friends for a short time i probably really you know resented him really bad he did cry and uh but but i kind of just didn't believe in him anymore what was, uh, did you ever find out what any of those secrets were that Billy was uh, hiding at that time? I think, I think um, that uh, he had this other business going on that he wasn't willing to talk about. And I think he's come out and said after the fact, only I've seen some of his interviews, that possibly selling cocaine. But if that was what he was doing, he didn't tell me that. But uh, he he did write me a nice message after my book, to be honest, and he said he was really sorry he kept secrets and he didn't wish anything but happiness for me. So I per that was the only time I ever heard from him in 30 years, and I did get a random message from him. Is the uh, so, no. Billy Jack Haynes that we see in some of these videos that are out there today, is that the same person that you knew in those days, or is he, uh, has, has the years of whatever substances he's been putting into his body, has that kind of taken an effect on his, uh, on his mental health? Yeah, because, um... I think he hadn't even been wrestling that long. I'm not sure, 1983, 82, 83, I don't think he'd really been 
wrestle him that long. He was really humble and very polite, very nice. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't remember. Matter of fact, he said to me, you don't drive. You're 23, you don't drive. And I said, no, I never want to drive. And immediately he went out and bought me a, a car and he tried to help me out and introduced me to his dad who was blind and we would play Pac-Man quite a lot. He used to like to play Pac-Man and uh, I don't remember him being, um, you know, like he, like some of his more recent interviews. Yeah, he's very eccentric now, I guess. And I guess he was mm. involved in that uh big concussion yeah, I read that about was that. just yeah. dismissed I guess last week from what I understand and there's a story oh, really? in uh, yeah the the lawsuit I guess it was dismissed I vaguely heard about that yeah, yeah so I guess uh, I didn't follow that at all and there's a story in your book from your time in LA that I guess uh, Chris Adams somehow he knew Hulk Hogan from Japan and because of that you two were invited for the uh, the big taping between Hulk Hogan and Sylvester Stallone uh, for Rocky Three, could you tell us that story? Because that's an iconic movie now. Yeah, because Chris and I were what would like rave about the Rocky movie when we saw it in the UK. I think it would be about late seventies. I'm not sure. And obviously, like Hulk was in the movie and. Um, he he said, "Hey, why don't you come by and and uh, watch us do the filming for it?" Um, it was amazing because you know I was like 21, I think, and here I am, like uh, talking to Sylvester Stallone. It's one of those moments that you go, "Wow," you know. So that was I was really grateful that. Uh, Terry invited us to that, yeah. And you do have a picture of yourself with Stallone that, that's a great picture, and I guess you screwed up the picture of uh, Stallone with Chris, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, see, Chris said to me, um, go down and ask him to take a photograph. And I'm like, no, I can't, I'm too shy. And he said, no, go on, go, go. He said, just walk up to Stallone. And he was at the ringside with his bodyguards. And... Um, oh, okay. So I walk up and I tap uh, Sylvester Stallone on the shoulder. He kind of looks over his shoulder at me and I'm, and I went, hey, would you take a picture or something like that? I was really shy. And his bodyguards, his hands came out and like, come on, get back, get back. He said, oh, she's all right. And he said, yeah, no problem. He said, I'll be over in a second. So he kept his word and he walked over and, um, we had those little yellow sort of instamatic cameras back then. He, uh, I, Chris took a picture, a really good picture of me and Sylvester Stallone. And when I took one of him, I was shaking because I was like, oh my God, it's Sylvester Stallone. And I cut their heads off. <laughs> so when Chris, the picture of Chris and Stallone came back, it didn't have their heads on it. <laughs> I'm really bad about that. I was sorry, Chris. Oh, my God. I just couldn't concentrate, you know, that good on taking the picture. I was like, oh, my God, this is, you know, one of my favorite, because uh, I'd watched the Rocky film, so I was, like, having one of those wow moments, you know. Was that recorded at an arena, or was that on a studio set? It was at the Olympic Auditorium. The oh, one at the that actual was, Olympic that, Auditorium? That was yeah, the same one that uh, Chris wrestled at and after we um took the picture we sat with um terry and at his table to eat lunch and just watched the whole process of them making the movie it was really interesting and special kind of moment to re remember because we hadn't even been in la that long i think uh just a few months so here we are in midlands the uk and the next minute, we're on the set of Rocky with Hulk Hogan, you know, so it was really cool for me as a 21-year-old and a fantastic memory, and I got the cute picture uh, of it as well, which is really cool. What was Hulk Hogan like in those days? Because I guess that was right before he absolutely exploded in popularity due to that movie, partly. Oh, he was 
just really nice and I didn't get to talk to him a whole lot um, but uh, I just remember him you know being just really nice just normal guy you know I remember Andre was there as well and he came to our apartment and I uh, took up the whole couch I mean I can't believe how you know how how big he was I forgot to put that in my book but there are a few things I missed but you know I uh, I remember Andre being and Tom Pritchard was there who uh, Chris was working with at the time and he I think he him and Chris used to hang out and those are happy memories of Los Angeles did. before it all went pear shaped <laughs> Oh, yeah, did Andre uh, drink every drop of alcohol you guys had in your house when he was over? Yeah, he, his hand actually, you couldn't see the beer, beer can, because his hand covered the beer can, but uh, he he stopped by, and um, yeah, I, I just thought that was really cool meeting him as well, very nice man to us, to me. So I guess after your marriage to uh, Billy Jack Haynes ended, you dated one of the star players of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a while? <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, uh, basically, this is what happened. Um, we are in uh, Portland, and Billy went off to Florida to work with Dusty, I think. And Chris went off to... Um, Chris went off to uh, uh, the Von Erics, and I went back to England for six months because I, I just wanted to get myself together. I, you know, had wanted to go home and see my family. Uh, Billy and Chris both found me when I was in the UK. So, uh, you know, I I was friendly at that point with Chris, and. Uh, Billy and I said, "Yeah, you know, we're we're get a divorce because we're still married." We we uh, so I had to fly to Florida to to get that divorce, and Billy actually got me a uh, a condo out in Florida. He paid for that for six months, um, and he you know didn't like leave me stranded or anything after the divorce. So that was nice. Um, after I that the condo ran out, I started working. I had a green card. I started working as a makeup artist in a, a, a department store, and I was single. But I was staying a, a, a little while before I got my own apartment at a place called the Hall of Fame Inn that was in Florida, in Tampa. And that's where the Buccaneers um, would train. And, uh, you know, Danny... Uh, Spradlin, his name was, he, he approached me and we actually went out for a long time really. Uh, he got cut from the Buccaneers and he went up, up to St. Louis. Uh, he, were, he was with the Cowboys before that. He went up to St. Louis and I drove his, uh, he had a little Mercedes and he asked me to drive his car up there. I went up to St. Louis for a little while and then I went back to Florida and uh, Funnily enough, that's when Chris found me when I was in Florida. I was still working as a makeup artist. And he goes, you know what? You said, why don't you move to Dallas? Because I've got this great idea that uh, of this angle I want to do with Gina Hernandez. It wasn't with um, Steve at that point. but This was like 84. So Chris had had this, this idea of doing this ex-wife angle with Gina, um, but I was quite happy in Florida at that time, so I didn't accept that. Um, I thought, oh, you know, I just got this really cool job as a makeup artist, and I I don't really know if I want to move to Dallas. But uh, by about 1985, or about a, a year after, something like that, I was kind of kind of in a rut in Florida, and because Chris and I had a daughter, obviously Jade. It, which we would fly back and forth between us. Um, I thought, you know what, this probably would be better off for Jay to have both her parents. And Chris actually got me a condo uh, that he sorted out for me. Um, I hadn't met his wife at the time. Um, I asked how that would work out because I had no romantic feelings for Chris. 
but uh, we had managed to pick up us behind us and move on and become friends. And um, that's when I moved into the condo in Lover's Lane and directly next door to Gina. And that would be the first time I met Gina as a neighbor and and, um, and settled into uh, living in Dallas. And, of course, I guess you actually went out with Gino Hernandez, and you were also friends with him. Uh, oh, I didn't date Gino, really. Oh. I was very good friends with him. But you did go out on uh, the town with him, right? Because you definitely oh, we, talk about yeah. one of those occasions in your book. Oh, I went out with Gino quite a few times, but I, I only saw him wrestle the once. I didn't really know any other than him as a neighbor I saw the hair match with the Von Erichs that was the only match I saw directly after that match uh, they had their head shaved and uh, um, I was invited to that uh, event which was great at uh, I think it was the cotton ball I think yeah um, I think that was that, the second uh, cotton ball. Af- yeah after that event um, uh, which I went there with Chris and Tony. We all got back to our condos, and you know they were like high as a kite because it was a great night. You know, great, great house. And, and everyone was doing um, drugs in that territory at the time, right? Because it was the eighties, and that territory was known for it. Ah, uh, uh, it was with Kevin and Kerry, and and uh, we we got back to the condos, and I was sitting at uh, Chris. Chris and Tony's apartment, and uh, Gino comes knocking on the door. Um, I hadn't been anything but just friends with Gino, uh, which I didn't really see him. Um, which he he was like really happy, <laughs> and uh, he he is, is. Chris said, "You drive with Gino, and I'll drive with Tony." <clears throat> and uh, I got in Gino's Porsche, and from from the condo to the nightclub, he he probably went about a hundred miles an hour, and he's looking at me, he's all glazed, and uh, he he offered me um, a piece of paper, <laughs> which uh, he said, oh no no, he'll be fine, he'll be fine, look after you. I didn't know what it was or anything like that, but uh, I think he just come back from Hawaii. He said, and I think he like got acid. It was acid, <laughs> but uh, we got to the nightclub and everybody was like overly excited, and we had a, a lot of fun that night. We, you know, just were hanging out at the bar. Everybody was laughing, and um, I just remember, you know, being laughing at me because I. I was like trying to walk to the bathroom and it, it felt like my feet were going into the floor. So I was like, oh my God, you know, and I, I went around the edge of the nightclub, like uh, with my hands up against the wall, just laughing and laughing. And after that, uh, I really did get back to the apartment. Just, you know, went back to his apartment and I went back to Chris and Tony's apartment and Chris stripped off naked and dumped in the swimming pool. It was a commu- like a pool where everyone could use. And uh, yelling, and he was just jumping in there, and, and um, everybody, it was just crazy, you know, that night. Yeah. How popular was Gino in those days? Because we did an interview with Missy Hyatt recently, and she said that the girls just absolutely loved him. Well, I didn't know, because I didn't um, see Oh, they had just arrived, um, literally, just a little time before he passed, I guess. Is that it? Um, I only knew him for a few months, you see, because I got there in 85 and he passed in 86. But uh, we we saw each other all the time. And basically, Gino, uh, after the night, we went out in the nightclub, uh, he, was, he was a member of um, a really cool nightclub. Uh, called the Rio Room. It was one of the ex- really exclusive nightclubs. You had to be like a member to get in there. And he said to me, oh, come on, let's go. So we went that night to the nightclub and uh, he was perfectly fine and acting normal um, in the club. And we stayed there together for, just, it was just Gino and I with some of his friends for a few hours. And 
<clears throat> when we got to the apartment, um, we said, oh, we'll have a beer in his apartment. And basically, um, he he opened uh, the cupboard of, of his kitchen uh, cupboard and he reached up on the top and he brought down a, 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 a cereal bowl, which was full of cocaine. It was like a lot of cocaine. And he started using a lot of cocaine. Um, and it wasn't very long, maybe 15, 20 minutes after that, that uh, he got very, very paranoid, very quiet, and and his demeanor changed. And he started sort of looking out the window, and um, he there was one part where he had a gun that they write about um, in the book. And clearly what happened is we, we, he, he actually... Um, turned on the water to his sink and he put the plug in to the sink and the water was filling up and then coming over the top of the sink onto the floor so it was flooding the kitchen so that, my natural reaction was I, is I walked up to to pull the plug out so my, my hand into the sink into the water to pull the plug out and Gino grabbed my hand to stop me doing that and he kind of pulled me back he, was holding me really tight my waist I was kind of holding on to the fridge door because he had me in um, a really tight grip and uh, I was trying to just talk to him and he was like shh no no be quiet you know and I, I twisted around and he actually had a gun in his hand and I was like oh my god you know Gino like that shh, shh no 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 then and the water was still like pouring over the sink. Um, we were about 15 minutes standing there and it, without saying anything. That was exactly a week before he died. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I've got a bit of a cold. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a scratchy throat. And they, when they, when he passed away, from what I understand, it said they found the cocaine in his stomach from the alleged overdose. So. Do you think find that's a little bit weird because most people are not going to eat cocaine. They're usually going to snort it or maybe smoke it. I, from what I understand, some people used to roll it up in cigarettes in that territory. But do you find that a little odd that he had, had the cocaine in his stomach? Yeah, um, I, I, I can't I can also say that one week before, one week before, when I was actually with him the whole night and for hours and hours that night, he, he was super paranoid. He had put the gun down, but he used so much cocaine. I actually uh, did think he could OD that night, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, if, you know I, he did end up snap, snapping out of it. And he actually said, "Look, stay here. Uh, I'm I'm going to go out." And and I did stay in his apartment alone for a while. But I was very tired because we'd been to the Rio room and all the stuff with the gun and that. And I actually phoned up Tony, and she popped down to sit with me. And 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 I actually left the apartment. I saw Gina the next morning. I went over to his apartment and said, "I'm so sorry. I I was so tired." And he said, you really must think I'm a moron. And I'm, no, I don't think you're a moron. I, I said to him, so how are you feeling now? How do you feel now? And he said, oh, I feel great. And, and he looked great. And he, he acted just normal again. But um, I, I, you know, I heard about the cocaine in his stomach. I did, I was around the, the whole week. Um, I saw him um most days up and i actually was the last person to see him alive and we did do a vice special that um, investigated gino's death and that hasn't um, aired yet right that's going to air no, no. maybe this yeah, year that later is this in year. february oh next february okay yeah yeah it's going to be in october but they moved it to february 
because for those that don't know, you, Vice is doing a whole series, that. right? Vice is doing a whole series yeah. on wrestling uh, mysteries and tragedies, I guess. Yeah, yeah. As much as I, you know, hear the, the different people and maybe he got murdered and that, I, I actually don't think so. It, my own opinion is because after... Okay, so he, I saw him... Uh, the last time I saw him was um, the Thursday prior to his death. Um, and I was actually at Chris's apartment, and Chris had now gone to the UK because I'd had that blinding angle. Yeah, so he had to disappear for a while. Yeah, and um, uh, I was at Chris's apartment because I was keeping an eye on it. I had the key to Chris's apartment, and... Um, I had was on the balcony, sort of airing out the apartment, and, and here comes Juno's car, and he gets out the car, and he looks up, and he goes, hey, kiddo, like, waved at me, and he, look at what I got here, and he said it was a peach pie, he had a box in his hand, he said it was a peach pie, and that was the Thursday, and he was like, oh, I'm going to go out, whether he did go out or not, I don't know, but the next day, um, his car was, parked um very out of line um like the wheels were kind of uh turned uh, turned in a funny position like he'd, he'd driven and he hadn't really thought about how he was parking which wasn't usual for him um then um i i knocked on his door because i thought his car was parked like that and having the memories of the week before with the gun I was just going to go check on him. So I knocked on his door and there was no answer. And a little bit later on, I saw his car hadn't been moved. And I knocked on his door again. I, I could see through his door and I saw the, the box with the pie. Uh, <clears throat> what he said was the pie on his table. And, uh, and um, nothing really was anything wrong in his apartment and uh excuse me just one sec <coughs> i'm so sorry i have a bad cold um so a couple couple of more days passed um i did say to my friend vicky who lived there you know katrina's car hasn't been moved and and i think something's really bad wrong because uh he's not responding and nothing's moved in his apartment because I could see through the window nothing has moved and I, you see I haven't been going to any of the matches at the sportatorium so I did not know anybody like David Manning or Rick Hazard I had nobody's phone number and Chris had gone to the UK so I didn't have a contact of anybody to call and say do you want to come over and check on Gino and I was terrified that he may be sleeping or he may be dropped his car off and went somewhere and he may have all that cocaine and if I called somebody would he get in trouble so it was kind of a, a, a strange point of no, not knowing what was the right thing to do it's a bit of a dilemma oh my god you know is he okay maybe he's not okay but what if if I would have um, called the police um, would he be mad at me you know so I was only young I was like in my 20s and I didn't know anybody to reach out to um the next day after that which I believe was the Tuesday I saw lights of the ambulance and the police um kind of people Gino's door was open and you know I just thought oh my god you know I I, I actually feel really terrible because I kind of knew something might have been wrong, and, and then they wheel out his body. And uh, it's just sort of like, it's one of those surreal moments. Like when when you watch 9-11, you go, hold on a second, that plane didn't really just hit into that tower. Am I seeing things? It was kind of like a surreal moment that you're like, you don't want to think it could be true. But... Uh, I phoned up Chris and Tony actually answered the phone and shut out the biggest scream and um, I don't know 
I didn't know who the people were that were there. I think it may have been David Manning and Rick Hazard, but I wouldn't have known them at that time. But I did know Walter, because I'd seen Walter all the time at Gino's apartment. And um, he was very upset. He actually came up to Chris's apartment to talk to me. Um, Walter was the person that I think alerted the police. I'm not sure. Or it was David Manning. Um, I don't know what went on prior to the police coming at all. Um, you know, what happened to any cocaine or whatever. But I did speak to, what What do they call the people that will the body out? Is it a coroner or something like that? Uh, um, the coroners are the ones that investigate the cause of death. Uh, I guess the people that wheel the body just work for the funeral home. I forget what they're called. One of those people... Um, I spoke to one of them, and, you know, they said that it looked like he just fell down like a tree, his face down, the gun was there, and I thought it was in his bedroom, in the corner, in his bedroom, that he died. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think in my mind, he probably, because the body had actually decomposed, forgiven, you know, a lot by then, and um, and I believe he probably died on that night, same night I saw him with the pie box because I think he'd probably been dead two or three or four days, even when I was knocking on the door. But I wouldn't, I didn't know because where I could see in to his apartment, I, he was actually in his bedroom where his body was in the corner in his bedroom, which which I could only see the living area, the dining area, and the kitchen and i couldn't see through to his bedroom um but and you knew um, he had a my, cereal my, bowl full of cocaine so you didn't want to alert the police that's obvious well well you know look i'm 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 young i'm frightened very naive do you know yeah i understand had even left you know but i did get a serious feeling of his car not being moved that there was a problem and I told my friend Vicky I'm so scared I don't know what to do um nobody to reach out to that I knew because I wasn't you know going to the matches or anything so I don't think anyway there would have been anything they could have done because he'd already obviously been dead for a few days so when I was knocking on the door he was actually already dead because there's no way he hadn't died, you know, quite some time when they actually took the body out. The next day, um, I did go into his apartment because um, Walter was there and he invited me into the apartment. And, um, you know, obviously, that, you know, no disrespect to Gino, but obviously there was an odour. And, and I, I did go into his apartment the next day. I walked to the bathroom and, and uh, they cut out the carpet in the corner where... I think Walter probably cut out the carpet um, where he, you know, had laid for several days. Yeah. Now, being around the world-class territory, there's all these stories about the Von Erichs would be impaired quite often. Did you ever witness anything with uh, with the Von Erichs uh, arriving to shows out of it or anything like that? Well, see, um, when when I got to um, when I got to Dallas, late '85, um, I only met the Von Erichs stuff very little because I wasn't really I was actually working m myself, and so I didn't actually um, really attend the wrestling events. I saw Chris every day and Gino pretty much, but I didn't really know uh, Kerry and Kevin that well. I met them a handful of times. Um, I knew Chris because he was actually working when Jerry had the, uh, uh, and he was involved in the angle that, that we did with Steve and Chris and Tony. Yes, and why don't we uh, get into that right now for the last thing we'll uh, talk about today is the angle that, that you did with Steve in, in World Class, which I guess was continental at the start of it because at that time, I guess, Jerry Jarrett had uh, kind of bought out World Class, something along those lines. We'll be interviewing Jerry Jarrett next week, actually, so I'll get the 
I'll get the full story, but you want to explain uh-huh. how that started? Um, like I said, you know, Chris had this XYZ angle idea a few years before with Gina. Um, basically, Chris fucked me up. Um, he, he had had got into business with Jerry with the wrestling school. Um, and, uh, and that was because Jerry owned the contract to be the sole... Uh, person that runs the sportatorium at the time so they wanted the wrestling school to take place during the week to make use of the rental I guess I think so although I'm not positive I think it actually did the wrestling school after the tapings on a Saturday morning I think but I don't know it could have gone on in the week as well I really don't know um I do recall um uh Chris phoning me up before he asked me to do the angle and it, he would talk about Steve, like, wow, you know, he's, I actually think there's potential with one of my students called Steve Williams. He, and I, I think he knew something special because most of the um, time Chris would say that a lot of people that showed up, he didn't think were going to ever become anything other than this one guy called Steve Williams. And that's the only time I heard of Steve at that point. Um, and, and I believe Steve started wrestling as Steve Williams, just the student against the uh, teacher or whatever, um, which I never saw any of those matches. Um, and then and then Chris phoned me up and he said, you know, I'd like to try this ex-wife angle again with my student, Steve Williams, and would like to bring you in and how do you feel about that and I I think he he approached Jerry and got the okay on that and uh, I thought it sounded like a lot of fun I I was doing um, a lot of my own uh, shows in in novelty telegrams because I owned a business called Genius I did novelty telegrams so I was quite used to being a performer because that was the sort of telegrams where you go out and you sing or dance and they're all cute like you could do them in restaurants or you could do them in uh, offices and dressed as a cop or a nurse and it's a bit 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 like a prank really uh, to embarrass someone for their birthday or whatever so i i had my own business and i was used to like doing about 40 shows a week and and I, I couldn't travel because obviously I had a full-time commitment with my business. Um, but uh, Chris said it Friday night and Saturday morning. And I thought it would be a nice change because um, I had uh, other performers that I hired. And I thought oh, that that would be a nice change to, to get out and do that. Um, he, he said to me, uh, you know, if you could... Uh, look at this show called Dynasty which had uh, a character on there played by Joan Collins called Alexis Carrington and he said oh that's that's how I want you to be um just like you know real smarty real sort of I'm better you know I got nice clothes and all of this and so I watched a little bit of Dynasty to get an idea and um got my uh dresses and stuff like that from a friend who who owned the shop and she'd let me wear these really really nice dresses and um so uh, i showed up at the sportatorium and tony introduced me to steve for the first time and and he was a little aloof that time i, I actually was tony said hi honey, this is steve and oh hi steve like no who and he kind of turned around and he walked up the stairs to the clothes nest so i went are you sure that steve's call to do the same well, are you sure he wants to because I'm not sure he, he he looks too happy about it um so I didn't know what he was thinking right at first but um as as uh, we started the angle and we plan up the match and talk about the interviews Steve and I uh, got really friendly we were you know always having a laugh about the interviews that we did and uh, we bonded as really good friends for for quite a long time really several months we didn't like go out or date or anything we were how you doing and how was your week and what's what's up and all of that talk about the weather so 
So we, we, we were just like really good friends. And, because he had and, a uh, girlfriend or, an, or a fiancé at that yeah, time, Yeah, he was right? married. Oh, yeah. Oh, he was married. Okay. Oh, yeah. He had a fiancé. Um, but he, 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 he told me and, um, you know, that, you know, he wasn't happy. And he wrote me a lot of letters. Um, I am friends with Steve. I'm, I'm, I have no bitterness to Steve. We have two beautiful daughters. I'm always going to be grateful I met him. And I'm, some of those letters are in your book, by the way, for those people listening that want um, to read those letters. My, 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 co my co-writers said they were quite relevant because of that, what you just said, that, that he had a girlfriend. I didn't come across as someone who stole him away because he actually was really instigating a relationship with me. And he really, you know, we thought that my writers thought they would be relevant, um, to, to the story of how, you know, this romance blossomed between us. Um, I'm so sure he loves uh, people reading about those with his with his uh, tough guy image. I'm sure he's he loves he, that people can read his love letters he, now. He's it's, 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 it's tough guy. Right? You know, he's, 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 a, he's a nice person. You know, he, he's got a really good side. You know, like a day, you know, it's just, business and uh you know he, so you, he's quite soft actually yeah so that that kind of charmed you and then after a while while you were still yeah. uh i guess you stopped doing the uh the the feud played itself out and then he went on to wrestle for jerry jarrett in memphis because no no the, the feud the feud didn't play itself out because Chris had really purposely tried to make that feud go. He wanted it to go for a year because um, it, he said he didn't even want to bring Tony in for a couple of months. So it was a shame because we had actually a lot more planned that we talked about where we were going to carry on, carry on, but then it just, something happened. I don't know exactly what happened, but suddenly it was over. Um, right, because yeah, Tony yeah, was yeah. Chris's yeah. new wife that you ended up becoming yeah. good friends with, and it was yeah. gonna. You guys had some cage matches together, I think, and it was gonna go on. But, but as you were saying, sorry. It was, it was just like a, a soap opera because um, Chris, Chris uh, had had like all these different twists and turns and things we were going to do, so we were quite disappointed, really. Matter of fact, Chris wanted to take the angle to WCW. Um, Steve went on to Memphis, um, and some of the time, um, I, I would go to Memphis to see him, and I did a little bit of work in Memphis, but I still had my business and a mortgage and, and uh, a town employee, so I, I went there when I could. Um, and the pay Steve, wasn't great in uh, Memphis, right? Steve was making about forty dollars a night, from what I understand. Yeah, so so he said, but I I really don't know about his. I didn't know what he was being paid at that time. Um, but um, I do I do know that uh, what happened after that is is uh, Steve when he did come back to Dallas, he he would stay at my house or some of the time and uh, um, and he used my phone number as a point of contact for his new job at WCW and uh, I, I got a phone call from uh, Magnum asking for Steve and I'm um, no sorry you know he, he's at the gym just now I'll give him a message and he's like hey where, where are you from just started up a conversation with me um, what do you do and I said actually I, I did work uh, with Steve here, here in Dallas, but that got cut off. He, oh, really? And and they actually hired a girl to to be with Steve called Vivacious Veronica. I don't didn't see any of her work or know her. I only know that um, they didn't think they, that Steve had good chemistry with her. So Magnum actually asked me, "Do you happen to have any tapes of you and Steve?" Because uh, you know, we'd be interested to see them. So I didn't try to get a job at WCW at all. Um, I did end up sending some tapes, and then Magnum phoned me, and he said, 
Okay, he said, I, I, I need you to go to Houston tomorrow and meet Dusty. So I was like, oh, my God, really? So I phoned up Steve, and I'm, who, who is in Houston working, and I said, oh, you know, I'm due to come in today. You know, really, I, I'll come and pick you up at the airport. So I, I get to uh, Houston like, on a day's notice, and I have an interview with Dusty. It didn't last long, about 10 minutes. And um, then Magnum said, okay, you, you can be at TV in at the center stage in Atlanta in two weeks. And it was kind of like, oh, my God, i got to uh, find someone to run my business. And that's when, um, obviously, Dusty came up with the name Lady Blossom and put me with Steve. And Chris and Tony did want to go in and do the, the end of the angle there, but it didn't happen. But would have been great. I would have loved that. Because Steve, I guess, held a grudge over a... Yeah. Before he signed with WCW, Steve had a booking with a different company for, I guess, $100. And Chris Adams had a show the same night. And yeah. he I didn't th want to... I think his name was Ed. Um, yeah. Yeah, but basically what happened was Chris said he'd match the pay, so Steve backed out of the other job. And then Chris didn't match the pay. He only got forty dollars or something. So, um, according to both Steve and you, from what I understand, he always held a grudge um, towards Chris. Due to well, that. yeah, no, I I can understand that actually because don't forget back then, um, you know, a uh, hundred dollars was a lot of money. As as Steve would say, it was on a tuna and potatoes diet, and you know, getting gasoline and. Um, a hamburger was like a lot of money so when it, Chris kind of put him in a corner there because he did take the job with the other guy and, and Chris got a little bit mean there because um, Steve said oh you know I, I, I've already booked for that and Steve oh, I'm Chris is like I'm the one who got you started you know loyalty should be to me and I'll give you a hundred and and, and Steve, went, he's not the type of person, to be honest, that would pull out and let someone down. He's pretty, you know, honest if he says he's going to do something. And Chris put a lot of pressure on him. And then when Steve phoned Chris up and said, you know, hey, you, you've given me like 30 bucks and you told me you'd give me the 100. Chris goes, oh, you know, uh, don't don't you know who I am, or well, words to that effect, and Click hangs up the phone on Steve, which was very honest, so I, I actually can't blame Steve for having feelings like that. And you said that uh, in your book that you enjoyed working for WCW, but the schedule was very taxing on you? Like, all yeah. the traveling? Yeah, I wasn't, yeah. Well, you know, because the flights, and hey, you know, I can say that about me, and I didn't even do anything to what the guys were. So, firstly, you know, you know, the guys were brilliant, and because I was just like, you know, valet. So, I can't imagine how it was on them. But um, I, I did think, you know, because the flights were so early, um, and by the time you got out the arena, um, you got back to the hotel, you went something to eat, you got to the hotel, and. And, you know, you could grab a few hours sleep and, and, you know, I did find that quite difficult, if I'm honest, but um, you know, I had to buy clothes and had all the makeup and all that to do as well, so, you know, I did I did find it quite, you know, difficult. It sounds really glamorous, you probably know that, that yourself, but, you know, after you do it, like, every day for, you know, pretty much a couple of days off for a few months. Um, it, it, it kind of can be quite tiring on you. Do you have any highlights of your time in WCW? Um, I thought my, probably my highlight would be a match they had at the Omni, where it was a match with Sting, who I, I was a fan of his work when I first got there, and then we had the match, which was where Steve got the belt, I think, and I had to come in the ring and um, that would that probably be a highlight. I don't know if, what, what it was. Also with Bobby Eaton, when, when we got the TV title match, that would have been a highlight for me too. And and 
It was so poor having a T-shirt, you know. <laughs> so oh, that, that's, that's probably a very, very rare T-shirt because I think the T-shirt came out for a couple of weeks before um, I left. So um, I don't think they, you know, that T-shirt was out there for very long there. It's probably worth a lot these days for anyone that has it. <laughs> I don't know anyone who has it. I used to have a couple, but long gone. I don't know where they are now. Of the originals, of not copies. You know, someone made me a copy there. <laughs> I guess to to quit your business, you must have been offered a pretty decent sized contract with WCW uh, to to leave your business and and go on the road with WCW. No, I didn't. I got uh, a con. con I came in at seventy five thousand a year, um, and uh, I sold my business. But also bearing in mind, um, you know, Steve and I were dating, and um, we wanted to be together at that time. You know, we were talking about getting married, so um, it was a serious relationship, and so. I wanted to be with him at that time as well. And you ended up getting pregnant, according to your book, that was not planned, uh, and that's what actually yeah. took you out of WCW. Was that, were you originally just going to go on a leave, or when you got pregnant, did you say, okay, I'm just going to be a stay-at-home mom for a while and leave my contract? Um. I don't recall exactly how it happened, but I think the office spoke to Steve and not me, believe it or not. Um, so, um, I, I did notice um, I felt a little sick, and um, actually my daughter was born on July 7th, 92, so if you rewind it, you, you can see I was probably about a month or two pregnant at Halloween Havoc match, um, and I couldn't take any more bumps. And I, I think actually Steve spoke with the office about that before they you know just said you know that was it and, and I was off but I was quite happy about that because um you know well we were talking earlier uh childhood um I never really had a good family life and and then going from territory to territory with Chris obviously that wasn't a good family life so to me the the actual option of um getting married and, and having kids and having a family life was actually more of something I, I had a hope and dream of more than working in the industry. So to me, it was like looking at houses and looking at baby stuff to me was like more important than working as Lady Blossom. So I was happy about leaving. It wasn't anything bitter and I think we just, you know, that was it and I was happy about that. Did they pay you out I think the rest Magnum of your contract? I think Magnum. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think Magnum called Steve, and Steve said, "Oh, it's over." And I was like, "Okay." And he said, "No problem." You know, we 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 had a very happy marriage through the time we were in Atlanta. And I guess prior to that, you had a nanny looking after Jade when you were away, so it was a bit of a. And I found that so. Okay. I found that so difficult, and I, I definitely, definitely hated that part of it. Um, um, it was something that was always on my mind, and obviously as a new baby on the way, there wouldn't have been any way I would have, even though Jeff did call me to invite me to be um, work in Memphis as um, Nanny Simpson, which I said I... Uh, I, I wasn't able to do that because I, you know, had two kids. And um, I actually said Tony would probably be interested, and Jerry did call Tony to do that. So. And Tony... You know, uh, I, I wouldn't have, yeah. Tony had a bad ending to her relationship with Chris, I guess, too. There was, I guess, by that time, allegedly, there was some uh, domestic abuse going on, and she ended up dating one of the Von Erichs towards the end? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I didn't, uh, I saw a lot of the violent side of Chris in, in small parts, um, but I, I was more, um, I'm, I'm quite a quiet person. If I'm out with people, I, I tend to listen more. I'm not, 
and Tony was much more feisty than me. Um, so I think it was a similar situation with Chris and his cheating. I think all his relationships, that was the case. He was just that way inclined. Tony would cry. She would come over to my house. Um, can I stay the night with you? You know, because she had the same issues as I did, and she was beautiful, Tony. Um, and he, he again would, you know, always be with someone else. But they, they had gone to a party, and he, like, was picking up a girl uh, right in front of her. Um, they left the party, and she was angry. They'd been drinking a lot, and they were driving along the road, and... Um, she was like shouting at him and that, and boom, he clicked. He actually dragged her out of the car by her hair, and he beat her up. Um, and they actually, uh, the hospital actually called her father and said, you need to come down because her, her nose was broken, and I think it was just a little bit away from her brain. They actually didn't think she was going to live that night. And... Uh, she went back to him, to Chris, you know, because he would apologize and he would cry. It's a very similar situation to mine, and she'd forgive him. But again, she she just got fed up with it. Um, he he uh, made Tony feel so bad about herself, which he did to me, because when someone constantly makes you feel bad about yourself you don't want to be around them anymore um uh she did have a fling with kerry yeah uh she was very devastated when he died because she phoned me in at banner and she she was uh very fond of kerry and they they were seeing each other uh, quite a bit so no. yeah that's true for the uh did you only have one child with steve or is there more than no, one? No, I have two. Two, okay. <clears throat> Stephanie and Cassidy, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I haven't got to that part of the book kids. yet. <laughs> no, I have three. And Cassidy was born in 1996. Does Stephanie right, still live right with you? Right, about the, the time. No, Stephanie lives in Los Angeles. Okay. What's, what's she doing nowadays? She, Stephanie uh, is a stylist. Okay. She's got a great job out in Beverly Hills. She's a stylist. She um, has her own apartment. She looks after herself. She comes home twice a year to the UK to be with me and her sister. And she's actually having a really good relationship with her dad, so I'm happy about that. Um, they visit all the time, so things are going great with Stephanie right now. Cassie lives here with me just now. And she, you're the one picking her up at four in the morning, right? So I'm guessing she might be in the entertainment industry or the club industry. No, no, no. It's not. She's, she actually works at a hotel. She's oh. not in the entertainment industry. At four o'clock, I think, Rob. Some nights on the weekend, she she has to stay at the hotel to finish. So she gets off um, maybe about one thirty or 2 and then comes home and we have a cup of tea and... Those nights I, I like to go get her just because I don't actually sleep till she gets home because I worry about her. So. But no, she just works at a hotel. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, that's as far as I am in the book now to the end of your WCW yeah. career. So I'm going to finish the book okay. and maybe uh, next month we can do a part two and cover the rest because from what I understand from the prelogue, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of stuff that happens in the remainder of the book. And that book, again, for anyone listening, is Through the Shattered Glass. And it's available on Amazon and Kindle, I believe. And do you have yeah, a website? Yeah, it is, yeah. Do you have a website? No, I don't. No, no. Mm -mm. But, uh, and I can, what inspired me to write the book next time, um, you know, obviously it's um, a collection of, um, stuff with addiction and recovery that when I was in rehab and obviously you haven't read that part so we'll go there next time and we just scratched the surface of what she discussed in the first part of the book there's much more details on everything she talked about and more for those of you that are readers of wrestling books 
I've certainly read my fair share of them, and uh, I enjoyed the first part very much. So to close this off, do you want to remind people where they can follow you on social media if they want to uh, follow you or get in contact with you, possibly about booking you for an autograph convention or something like that? Well, I'm on Facebook with uh, under Jeannie Clark or Jeannie Williams, and I'm on Twitter at Clark Jeannie. Um, and that's it, really. That's my only social media way to contact me. And the last thing I'll ask about uh, you about is uh, Harry Smith, the son of Davy Boy Smith. Is uh, he wrestles for Great North Wrestling, which is our company here in Canada sometimes? But he's, yeah. he's the star of the new world of sport show yeah. in the UK and have you, I'm just wondering if you've seen the new world of sports show at all living over there um, I haven't actually yet um, but uh, I do know Harry and, and, and um, he's read my book and gave it a little plug for me and, and I know his mum obviously Diana and uh, I talk to her all the time and she's absolutely lovely and I, I really connect with her as a friend Yes, it sounds like you actually have been through a lot of the same things that uh, Diana, yeah, so I can understand yeah. that, and Diana's, I've known uh, since about 2001, and she's a wonderful person. And she is, absolutely, and we do, we have long chats about stuff, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I really like her and her daughter Georgia as well, so yeah, um, I have not met Harry yet, but uh, I've spoke to him quite a bit, and he he did read my book as well, and said he really enjoyed it. So I'm grateful for him for doing that. Well, I know that Harry does uh, watch this channel and listen to a lot of the things on this channel, so he very likely will listen to some of the clips I post of this interview. But I'd like to thank you again for speaking to us and. Uh, Hope your cold recovers by the next time we I talk. I apologize, but I'm so I've got this cough and a cold, and I'm sorry that, that if that is in my voice because I, you know, have this little illness going on. But um, I'm very grateful that you had me on, and I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Great North Wrestling Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Hannibal TV on YouTube for all the latest GNW news and videos. Follow at Devin Hannibal on Twitter and check out our website at thehannibaltv.com.